questions about the existence of God and about the role of humanity in the world mm -hmm. are problems for therapy. We will go through a process of adaptation and I think we'll probably fast forward that by changing our own DNA. I have real difficulty in not seeing the nest of a bowerbird as being just as beautiful as the Sistine Chapel. What if we're smart enough to hatch our own demise, but not smart enough to fix the problems? I asked another uh, guy, I mean a writer in, in genetics, a guy called Matt Ridley, about, oh, yeah. about yeah. Um, chimpanzee and human, you know, whether there was any possibility of interbreeding. And he said that it probably was possible. Potentially, you have to get over the difference in chromosome number, mm. which would cause problems during mitosis as the cells divided. But if you could get past that, potentially, yeah. We're very similar genetically. That's clear. Was but, it, but this, this is it something you'd like to see? No. You wouldn't like to see that? No, I you, wouldn't. You, I wouldn't. You think that's an... an no, I'd like to talk to a chimpanzee, but I, I wouldn't like to see a human chimp hybrid. I would. Mm. Perhaps that's the difference. Why is that? Just because you have a dark side and you, you want to see what will be revealed? Yeah. Do you think it would re reveal more about the chimps or the humans? Both. Yeah. I think both. I mean, like any way station between things, it would have to be fascinating. Mm. You see, what I, I suppose what I'm trying to drive at here uh, as a writer is, is that there is something... That, that, that being human may be a construct. I mean, you as a geneticist are going to want to tell me, no, you're human or you're not human in some important sense, but I'm not so sure that that's necessarily true. Okay, explain. Well, what's to say that we're any more human now than we were before the Great Leap out of Africa, before the, the, the agricultural revolutions of the, of the, of the Neolithic period? You know, but, I mean, what makes us any more human? I don't know that we are more human. Um, you know, this whole Neolithic transition is something that really bothers me. And mm. the, the things that were set in motion simply by growing a larger population. Mm. You know, and suddenly you, you need a hierarchy to control the people and you need religion and, and so on, organized religion. Um, mm. And, you know, those have had a bad effect long term. In fact, we've probably changed more since the dawn of the Neolithic than we did in the hundreds of thousands of years leading up to that. And basically what we're doing is adapting to the culture we've created, which is kind of a frightening thing because the, the culture, in a sense, has become a living organism on its own. It's almost like a virus, the way it's taken over. Do you look around you at airports, though, <coughs> and think these are... Uh, this, you know, I can almost see genes mutating in there. Do you think... I don't think we're changing fast enough at the genetic level. Okay. This is, you know, it's interesting because now we suddenly have the technology to choose the direction we want to take. And again, this is mm. something I'm looking at in the next book. But no, I mean, I, I think the shape of humanity, you know, the kind mm. of morphology of humanity is in the process of changing. We are mm. becoming rounder, plumper, sicker mm. human beings. Um, chronic disease is going to be much more important in the next century than infectious disease. And we will go through a process of adaptation, and I think we'll probably fast forward that by changing our own DNA. We'll choose the, tr the evolutionary trajectory we want to take, and are we going to choose the right one? That's the big question. Can that be construed of as an evolutionary change in itself? In it other can. Words? Yeah. Yeah. Having developed the technology. So we were pre-adapted to do this, if you will. Mm. by becoming clever enough to develop the technology over the last few centuries. Mm. We, you, it's almost predictable that mm. we would be able to do this at some point. But, but it's not going to be true of, of dwellers in the favelas of Rio and Sao no. Paulo. Or, no, or and so there, I think there's going to be a divergence in the world. It sounds H.G. Wellsian to me. It yes. sounds like the time traveler. It sounds like a picture of uh, the Moloch's living yes. underground and sort of hairy. And Does that not fill you with... Uh, more horror than a, a chimpanzee-human hybrid. It, it worries me. Again, are we going to make the right decisions? Mm. Um, you know, in, again in this book, I explore this notion of transgenerational power. Mm. We evolved for so long, for so many millions of years, having power over our immediate future. But now we suddenly have the power to change things many generations down the road. When you're choosing the genes to put in your children, you're choosing the genes that go into the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, mm. and so on. Mm. You know, how do you know that the genes you're choosing are going to be, are going to be good in 10,000 years or 100,000 mm. years? The next century is going to be a big challenge for humans. Well, to take the particular field of stem cell research and cloning, which, I mean, clearly what every... Well, we're sitting here in the center of Manhattan, and clearly there are a lot of people around here who will pay to have a uh, cloned 
alternate body for spare parts, to have a good bank yep. of stem cells on mm -hmm. hand to regenerate disease. To, they'll pay for that, won't yeah. they? Yeah. And we live in, in uh, we're currently in, I mean, I'm a citizen, but I, we're both citizens of the land of the free, mm. where, you know, everybody should have the right to be able to purchase what they want on the open market. In theory. As long as you don't harm anyone else, and that's the question. Are you doing But this is harm? my genes. Yeah. You yeah. can't take away my right to have my body clone that can bolt, I can bolt new bits on. Except or have my stem that, cells. That, that individual will be a human. And are you harming them by allowing the clones to Can't I have place? them produced, um, I, I can't remember what the correct, brainless. Can't I have a brainless clone? Would that still be human? No, it'll, it's just a body part bank, Spencer. Come on, you're just being a bit, emo you're being a bit emotive about this. It's the same as you were about the chimpanzee-human hybrid. Uh -huh. I mean, what is it that you find so distasteful about Well, the notion ideas? that you have, a, you have a brainless body that's being kept in some tank somewhere to serve as an organ farm for but you. But, I mean, it'll keep me... You've met me. I'm a warm, vital guy. And I, you know, I, I <laughs> what would a clone of Will Self look like? It would look like me, but it would have no, no brain. It'd have no brain. It'd be kept in the tank. But what if you had one with a brain? How would it be different from you? What would it learn well, surely or do it would, differently from what you Well, it would be a fascinating thing to, to witness. But this kind of... Um, I can't help connecting in my mind all of these topics because, you know, being, we're synthesists and you're an analyst uh, to some extent. And, and I, I don't think we will... I think our preoccupations with what is human are kind of parochial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you, you know, they lack, you know, it's, in, it's interesting in Western thought, for example, that there hasn't been a significant philosophic thinker for half a century. Mm -hmm. And indeed, philosophy... Who do you think the last one was? Wittgenstein. Camus? Wittgenstein, okay. No, I mean, Camus is a, you know, a fabulous novelist and a philosophic <laughs> masturbator. I mean, that's what <laughs> existentialism okay. is about. Right. It's, it's, you know, it's wanking in, a, in the shut room of the psyche. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, as, and, and, you know, for what happens to philosophy then, really, is that it runs up again. You know, Wittgenstein says there isn't metaphysics. You know, questions about the existence of God and about the role of humanity in the world mm -hmm. are problems for therapy, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it's, it's a misapplication of, of natural language. Mm -hmm. And actually, scientists like you, who in, in many ways would be viewed, in the, would have been viewed in the past as hard scientists, are increasingly coming into the realm, the pearliest of what used to be regarded as philosophical thinking. I think they, inevitably, mm. you know, you reach the edge of what you didn't know why you were doing it. You're doing it because, because there's a void. There's a void. Mm. Nature abhors a vacuum, mm -hmm. and and nature has told your brain there is Lebensraum here for my brain mm -hmm. because actually nobody's thinking importantly about these questions. Yeah, well. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess that has been a shift. This whole idea that scientists need to be concerned only with materialism, only with what you can explain, what you can rip apart, what you can reduce, you know, a big question to, we focus on these tiny things and then we just kind of sew them together and imagine that that's the way the system works. And I think now, particularly with, you know, in, in advances in computing, we realize that systems are incredibly complex and there's emergent behavior that you can't predict and so you have to synthesize and you have to think, outside the box, to use a nasty mm. American phrase. I don't, I don't mind it. You don't approach it de novo as in how could we design a perfect system to do this, you know, to interact with the world, to recognize the world, and, you know, to come up with a solution to deal with a problem. It's, you know, how would our ancestors have been doing this? Mm. And was there a selective advantage to doing it in a certain mm. way?